Hey, big day in the EV world. Rivian's got access to the Tesla supercharger network today. Gen X and millennials apparently buy the most EVs of any generation. The myth of EVs polluting more than ice is debunked. Duh. And Tesla has a chance to uh, increase its market share in the EV space even more because of all these EV startups that are faltering and the fact that legacy car makers are getting it wrong again. All this and more on this Monday, March 18th edition of EV Awesome. Let's get to it. Woo! Boom! Happy Monday, everybody. And before we get to the, all the big news today, just remember to hit that subscribe button right down there. Right down there. Just hit that little button so you can stay up to date with all my EV rantings. Speaking of which, it's a great day if you're a Rivian driver because you got access to the supercharger network from Tesla. Hallelujah. What a great day. And it can only mean that it's just one day closer to my Polestar, to my Polestar getting access because I believe it's GM, Volvo, and Polestar that come next. So it was only took about, what, two, three weeks after uh, Ford got access for Rivian. So maybe that means maybe another two, three weeks until GM has access and maybe another two or three weeks after that. Volvo, Polestar, come on, baby. It just makes me wonder, like, <clears throat> why do they not announce this stuff? Like, it's you wake up and you find out, oh, look, we have access. You know, why is there no date given? I mean, I, I maybe there's some reason for that. Like, they're afraid if they put out a specific date and they miss it for whatever reason, um, they'll look bad. I don't know. But it just seems to me like, why don't, why don't they announce it? Like, maybe give everybody a week a week's notice that, hey, you know, like next Monday, you're going to be good to go uh, on the Tesla Supercharger Network. I don't know why they don't announce it. Polestar, if you know the date, like a week in advance, let us know. You know, just let us know. Just send us an email, a text, put it in the app. I don't know. And I'm, I'm curious how that's all going to work because, um, you know, the Polestar app doesn't include any kind of like charging activation or anything like that. They don't have their own network. Um so that's kind of going to be one of the first, I think, probably the first, um, the first EV maker that doesn't actually have their own charging network. You know, because Ford had their own charging network. So Ford Pass, you could activate. I think Blue Oval chargers, GM, Ultium, um, even Volvo has uh, their own branded network. It's all Charge Points, but they're Volvo branded, and obviously Rivian had the Adventure Network. So I'm interested to see how that all plays in. Like, you know, will Polestar drivers still have to, uh, you know, use the charge charge your EV in the Tesla app, or will we be able to activate right from the Polestar app? And I can't wait to find out. It's going to be quite interesting. Um, also interesting is a uh, study uh, from Green Car Reports uh, reported on <clears throat> that actually was a study by Experian that Gen X and millennials buy the most EVs. Not really surprised. Gen X right here. Um, obviously, I think, you know, and boomers are the ones that tend to buy less EVs. And I think the point of this article is that, you know, we boomers buy less EVs and they're still kind of in charge of policy because most you know members of Congress are of the boomer generation. And, you know, I think it makes sense. It's just like most technology, you know, it's usually the older generation that kind of is slow to adopt it if they ever do. And usually the younger generations kind of uh, jump in there. I mean, I think for Gen X, speaking for myself as a Gen Xer, we're all of that age now where we've been in the workplace for a long time. You know, we, I don't want us to have tons of money, but, you know, we're kind of at like our sort of like right around our peak earning age, you know. And so, yeah, a lot of Gen Xers probably can afford to buy an EV. And millennials, I think they want EVs because it's the next thing. And I think most millennials probably have grown up with the whole uh, climate change fight. And they just feel like it's the right thing to do and electric cars are better than ice cars anyway, so why not? And so I just think it's interesting that, um, well, Gen X, like 9.4% of vehicle purchases are electric, and another 9.9% are uh, gas electric hybrids. And baby boomers, is only 5.9% uh, that buy electric cars. And you know what's funny about that is I know a lot of boomers, 
if you call them that, that uh, that actually do drive electric cars. So maybe it's just the the crowd that I that I roll with, um, the boomer crowd <laughs> that I roll with, that does drive electric cars. But it's true. I mean, I can speak for like my my own parents. You know, they're just afraid of it. They they literally. I mean, I've gotten questions like, well, you know, if the power goes out, what do you do? I'm like, well, if my car is charged to like 50%, the power going out doesn't drain the battery. And it's just like if you have gas in your tank and the power goes out, does the gas like drain out the tank? It doesn't. You know, it's like it's weird things like that that people, I think, I don't know, don't really quite think of. Like how would the power going out affect the state of charge of my car? Granted, it would mean that I can't charge my car at home. But if the power went out in my whole town, I wouldn't be able to pump gas either. So, you know, I think it's just things like that. It's just a different sort of mindset. It's a shift uh, in how you think about things. So I think that's harder the older you get because, you know, no offense, I'm not trying to be, I'm just trying to offend any boomers out there. But, you know, the older you get, the more set in your ways you are and you're kind of like harden your beliefs. You know, there's not a lot of people that by the time they get to like seven years old, are going to start changing their opinions on things. Usually their opinion, they just double down on it more, right or wrong. So I think that kind of explains it. But, you know, uh, this doesn't really surprise me that, um, you know, Gen X and Younger are the ones that are buying electric cars. And, you know, again, I think that's just points to where EV sales are going to go in the future. You know, if you're looking at where they are now and all this talk you hear about EV sales slowing down, well, if Gen Xers and Millennials are the ones buying the most electric cars and they're buying more as time goes on, electric car sales are just going to keep going up, right? Because we're going to keep going up, going up. Boomers are going to age out. And eventually, all there's going to be is electric cars. And that'll be a good day. Um, also, the myth, you know, you've probably heard this if you're an EV person um, or if you support EVs, that EVs actually pollute more than ICE cars because of, you know, how much pollution they create to uh, to build them. And I've always heard that and it just never makes sense to me because um, while it's true that uh, it does cost, it does create a little extra pollution to build EVs, mostly because of the mining for the batteries. Um, over time though, once the car is built, it doesn't pollute anymore. And you know, then you get that argument about, well, where do you think the electricity comes from? Well, yes, sometimes does it come from coal fired power plants? It might, but that's where the electricity to power my house comes from. <clears throat> that's where the electricity to power all those gas pumps out there comes from. So, and, and that's our, our electric grid is getting cleaner and cleaner every year and it's going to continue to get cleaner and cleaner every year. So, as it stands today, even according to um, uh, this particular study from the cool down, and actually they're referencing an article from The Guardian that basically shows that even with the dirtiest grid, after about 45,000 miles, an EV has already you know become cleaner for the environment, better for the environment than any gas car. Because at around 45,000 miles, it's made up for any of the pollution that was created to build the car. Whereas an ice car pollutes from day one until the last day that that car operates. It's always polluting. So whether it's at 45,000 miles, 90,000 miles, 130,000 miles, that car, every time you put gas in it and turn it on, you're sending nastiness into the environment. So only makes sense. EVs do not pollute more than ICE cars. And anyone, if you really just think about it logically and, and not just listen to what you hear on the, on the news and in the media, it makes sense. I mean, they don't pollute more than ICE cars. How could they? And lastly today, Wall Street investors, you know, they're looking at Tesla and saying, well, Tesla now, you know, has a chance to increase their market share in the EV space even more mainly because of rivals that are faltering, namely Fisker, although I don't think Fisker is much of a rival to Tesla at any point. Um, but also I think more, more so is that the legacy car makers are getting it wrong. Again, this shift to hybrids, you know, they're really trying to like slow down EV manufacturing a little bit, not completely, but a little bit, and shift more into hybrids because they think, well, that's what people want. That might be true, but it's still wrong that they're doing that because... Again, 
people my generation and younger want electric cars more and more and more. And, you know, hybrids, again, I always say they're the gateway drug to EVs. So if you're going to make hybrids right now, I guess that's okay. But you really need to have, if you're a legacy car maker in your long-term plans, you have got to be ready to ramp up EV manufacturing towards the end of this decade. It's got to be going because EVs are going to sell. And here's the thing. And this is where, you know, people get upset and they get political about it. But when we talk about the Chinese EV manufacturers, they make really good stuff. That's a fact. It's good. Their cars are fantastic. BYD, my Polestar, amazing. I think so well built, high quality. And when people want EVs and if they can't get them from the American car makers, they're going to demand to let the Chinese car makers in. And that really would be the end of the American auto industry because they'll just flood the market with low price, high quality electric vehicles that people are going to want and they're going to snap them up just like they, they snap up iPhones. They'll snap these things up. They don't care where they're made because they'll be better. So the legacy car makers really need to focus on quality and price. That's, that's the name of the game, right? High quality, good price, and they'll be fine. But they've really got to get better at that because it's something that American manufacturing, especially in the auto industry, has slipped a little bit. And I think, listen, American manufacturing is the greatest in the world. We have the most potential. We have the best people. We have the best technology and the best brains. We just need to put all that together again and get back to being really good at making stuff. And one of the reasons that we became kind of sloppy at it is because we sent so much stuff overseas. And that's why the Chinese got so good at it because we sent all our manufacturing over to them and they learned how to build stuff really well. And we kind of forgot how to do that in some areas. And I think it's time that we get back to being the best. And I know that we can because I work in the American manufacturing industry and I know so many people in the industry that are just the best at what they do and we just need more of that and we you know and we need the car companies to really get back to that like they need to concentrate you know they're always trying to to like one up tesla instead of trying to one up tesla maybe they should just look at what they do and and try to emulate that have the best software tesla and rivian right now have the best software of any car manufacturers out there I mean, my Polestar is pretty cool. It's, you know, the um, Android automotive um, operating system. And it's not, I mean, I, I don't really have any real complaints about it. But when you put it up against Tesla or Rivian, it's like, oh, it's kind of like the baby version of that. Like Tesla and Rivian are so good, right? And it's why? Because they're not legacy. I think that's one of the biggest reasons is that, they came into it with just a whole fresh approach. And I think the legacy car makers really need to try and emulate that. They need to sort of operate almost like a startup and just say, okay, well, if we had to start over again, what would we do? You know, how will we build our software? How will we build our cars? And I think that's the key to really harnessing what Tesla and Rivian have been able to do. Just, you know, and I know people are going to talk about the panel gaps on Teslas and all that, but you don't find a lot of Tesla owners that hate it. Most Tesla owners love their Tesla, right? Whether it be a, a Model 3, Y, X, S, Cybertruck now. You know, if you watch Kyle's video on, Kyle Connor's video on his Cybertruck, like, yeah, I mean, I think, he's, I think he said he still puts Rivian like a little bit ahead, but his Cybertruck is right up there. Like, he really digs it. And he was not like one of the, um, the biggest fans of the Cybertruck originally. But, you know, it's built in America, built really well. Tesla knows what they're doing. And instead of trying to beat them, try to be like them. Do what they've done. And that will get you where you want to be. But anyways, that's all I got to say for today. I know, like you're like, that's all. How many, how long are we into this? But anyway, as you guys know, EVs are awesome. And it's okay to be awesome. You're awesome. Like and subscribe. And I'll see you guys tomorrow. Mm -hmm.